In the United States, redlining is a systematic denial of various services by federal government agencies, local governments, as well as the private sector, either directly or through the selective raising of prices. Neighborhoods with high proportions of minority residents are more likely to be redlined than other neighborhoods with similar household incomes, housing age and types, and other determinants of risk, but different racial composition. While the best known examples of redlining have involved denial of financial services such as banking or insurance, other services such as healthcare or even supermarkets have been denied to residents. So before I go on, let me break this down real quick. Uh, even though you and Joe might have the same income level, and uh, instead of they giving loans based on you know income and the, the house and the, where it's at, the type of house, they make it based on race. And this is news to me that they even deny f- supermarkets being built in the hood because they know or they assume I should say that we not going to spend money in the or that we not going to spend enough money in the but at the same time the minority especially the black minority is the number one consumers in America anyway in the case of retail businesses like supermarkets purposely locating stores and practically far away from targeted residents results in a redlining effect Reverse redlining occurs when a lender or insurer, particularly targets minority consumers in a non-redlined area, not to deny them loans or insurance, but to charge them more than would be charged to a similarly uh, situated white consumer. In the 60s, socialist or sociologist John McKnight coined the term redlining to describe the discriminatory practice of fencing off areas where banks would avoid investments based on community demographics. During the heyday of redlining, the areas most frequently discriminated against were black inner-city neighborhoods. For example, in Atlanta in the 80s, Pulitzer Prize winning series of articles by an investigative reporter Bill Detman showed that banks would often lend to lower-income whites but not to middle-income or upper-income blacks. The use of blacklists is related to mechanisms also used by redliners to keep tracks of groups' areas, and people that are discriminatory party fields should be denied business or aid or other transactions. In the academic literature, redlining falls under the broader category of credits rationing. So they have a book or they have guides to tell them where to where to loan money to and where not to loan money to. And I'm sure this ain't just no book you can show up and buy, but you know, I guess the big dogs is they little secret that they keep between them. The United States federal government has enacted legislation since the 70s to reduce the segregation of American cities. While many cities have reduced the amount of segregated neighborhoods, some still have clearly defined racial boundaries. Since 1990, the city of Chicago has been one of the most persistently racially segregated cities, despite efforts to improve mobility and reduce barriers. Other cities like Detroit, Houston, and Atlanta likewise have very pronounced black and white neighborhoods, the same neighborhoods that were originally redlined by financial institutions decades ago. While other cities have made progress, this continued racial segregation has contributed to reduce economic mobility for millions of people. Yeah, man, you know, in cities like I've talked about it before, every city... I even had some of y'all tell me about cities in other countries, man, across sea, overseas, that north is always where the best side of town, and the south, and the east, or west, or whatever, is always the worst side of town, especially the south side. The practice of redlining actively helped to create what is now known as the racial wealth gap seen in the United States. Black families in America earn $57.30 
for every $100 in income earned by white families, according to the Census Bureau's current uh, population survey. For every 100 in white family wealth, black families hold just $5.04. Dang. Man. In 2016, the median wealth for black and Hispanic families was 17 grand to 20 grand, respectively, compared with white families' mean wealth of 171,000. Dang. Ooh, wee. Bro, you know. <laughs> Boy, ooh, wee. Man. So it's like I'm living. Think about this. You know, if if you and me, okay, let's say I make fifteen an hour, and my wife, um, I can't really work. We both can't work. We don't want to put our child in daycare. You know, we feel like, you know, if we can be there for, we can be there. So we kind of sacrifice a little money. But the average household with man and wife, kids, from the people I know, from the folks I done met. You can get about, you can get at about forty before taxes. So you doing forty before taxes, and the average family got, you know, probably one older car, and one car they making payments on in an apartment, and you know, and they just they doing all right. They ain't killing the game, but you know, they doing good enough. Put a little, car, put some Jordans on their feet or whatever. So imagine. If we, you know, if we, when we getting 40, we like, yeah, we, we doing all right. You know, I can't complain. But them folk pulling in 170? Whew, let me get back to the story, man. Uh, the black wealth gap has not recovered from the Great Recession in 2007. Immediately before the Great Recession, the median wealth of blacks was nearly 14% of whites. Although black wealth increased at a faster rate than white wealth in 16. Black still owe less than 10% of white's wealth at the median. Man, that's crazy, man. A multi-generational study of people from five race groups analyzed upward mobility trends in American cities. The study concluded that black men who grew up in a racially segregated neighborhoods were substantially less likely to gain upward economic mobility. Finding black children born to parents in the bottom household income quantile has a 2.5% chance of, the, of rising to the top quantile of household incomes. So when you're born in the hood, because they, you know, they write all these extra fancy stupid words, man. When you're born in the hood, you have a 2.5% chance of getting to that 171 grand compared with 10.6% for white people. So a white man born in the hood, it got 10% chance. Black man born in the hood got 2.5% chance. Because of this intergenerational poverty, black households are stuck in place and are unable to grow wealth. In 2017, study of Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago economic, 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 economists found that the practice of redlining, the practice whereby banks discriminated against the inhabitants of certain neighborhoods, had a persistent adverse impact on the neighborhoods, with redlining affecting home ownership rates, home values, and credit scores in 2010. Now, since many African Americans could not access conventional home loans, they had to turn to predatory lenders who charged high interest rates. Due to lower home ownership rates, slumlords were able to round apartments that would otherwise be owned. Now, I'm going to break that down real quick. So, since you can't get a loan from like Wells Fargo or Chase or, you know, one of the big boys, you got to get your loan from... You know, you can't get Capital One, but you can get a loan from Credit One. Now, the thing with Capital One, yeah, they got their interest rates, but the interest rates they got at Credit One, because Credit One saying, look, we know you got bad credit or whatever, but hey, come on, we'll give you this money. Come on and get it. We got you. Don't worry about it. But now, you're going to pay a little extra money, though. But see, we know you want to own your home because the American dream is, oh, you got to own your own. You know, old folk always telling me, you got to own your own. You got to own your own. Paying rent, you wasting money. 
So what people was doing was they running and people still doing it. They run into these predatory folks and they giving them that loan. But the interest rate is crazy, crazy, man. And then, depending on what kind of contract you got, your interest rate could go up. So now let's say you lose your job or you lose some of that income. You know, hey, <laughs> you know, it's, it is what it is. They ain't giving you no wall. Uh, they ain't cutting you no slack. You better have that money in that um account. Then you end up losing your home. Then you end up that going on your credit. Now you're either never gonna get another home, or when you do get one, the interest rate on that gonna be even higher because your credit jacked up. Now retail redlining is uh, sparsely. Spatially discriminatory practice among retailers. Taxi cab services and delivery food may not serve certain areas. Based on their ethnic minority composition and assumptions about business and perceived crime. Rather than the data and economic criteria such as the potentially profitable of operating in those areas. So they know they can make money there but they're saying look we ain't putting that junk there because uh, we ain't going over there because crime. Consequently, consumers in these areas are vulnerable to prices set by fewer retailers. They may be exploited, exploited by retailers who charge higher prices and or offer them inferior goods. Critics have argued that if such practices were causing retailers to avoid doing business in other prof- otherwise profitable areas due to the racial demographic of these locations. Retailers who avoided this practice and continue to do business in these areas would be at an economic advantage over the competition. Therefore, by choosing not to service a potentially profitable area, retailers would be lowering the quantity supplied to their good or service to below the market equilibrium quantity. So basically... You know, like, uh, let's say in a decent neighborhood, they might have a little shopping strip on, like, every major corner. You know, every major street, every major corner, you got, bam, Kroger, Walmart, um, Publix, you know, Food Depot, Walgreens, CVS. You know, they got everything, man, every corner. But then, when you get into the hood, you only got, you got Walmart here. Then you got a little Kroger down there. Skip a little bit, skip a little bit. So now what's happening is, since you don't have no other options, and we be spending money. Our Walmart be packed. You know, our Kroger be packed. Our stores be, restaurants got lines all out into the street. You know, we be spending money too. But we end up spending more money because it ain't no competition. Ain't nobody else, um... You know, ain't no other. Who else you gonna buy from? It's like, hey, we here, and uh, <laughs> that's it, man. So, you know, like when when Rona hit, and it got a little better now. But when that thing first hit, they was jacking up meat prices, man. And um, I had like um, my partner was telling me, man, he said he purposely was doing scouting reports. He'd go to Walmart in the, in the hood, then he'd go to Walmart out there on the other side of town. And he'll see a huge price difference. And I'm sure y'all have probably seen all the little viral videos and stuff about that. So, you know, they was really getting over. But if you ain't got no other competition, what you gonna do about it? Man, I never realized that one before. That's new to me, man. Oof. Wow. In 2012, a study by the Wall Street Journal found that Staples, Home Depot, Rosetta Stone, and other online retailers displayed different prices to customers in different locations, distinct from shipping prices. Staples based discounts on proximity to competitors like Office Max and Office Depot. This generally resulted in higher prices for customers in more rural areas, who are on average less wealthy than customers seeing lower prices. Oh man, so and that's another thing, like this thing ain't always just black and white. Sometimes it's some um cause you know, a lot of times I be doing deliveries and I be out in the little rural country areas and all they got is a dollar general, man. <laughs> you know. 
They got a all you see is Dollar General, Dollar General, a couple of family dollars and stuff, but just Dollar General, Dollar General. They Dollar Generals have a little more stuff in it, cause it. But I guess they figure like, dang, we ain't putting no Kroger out here, we ain't putting no Walmart out here, cause ain't enough folk gonna come to it, and they ain't gonna spend enough money. We gonna make them get in the car and drive, or get on the bus and go all the way to here. Man, that's crazy. So it ain't always just, you know, white and black. Some cases, um, you know, some cases other white people suffer too in some spots. Especially when it comes to this, um, this retail red line. Liquor line. Some service providers target low-income neighborhoods for nuisance, no, 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 nuisance, nuisance sales. Uh, when those services are believed to have adverse effects on the community. They may consider to be from a, a form of reverse redlining. The term liquor lining is sometimes used to describe high densities of liquor stores in low income and or minority communities relative to surrounding areas. High densities of liquor stores are associated with crime and public health issues which may in turn drive away supermarkets, grocery stores and or retail outlets, contributing to low levels of economic development. Controlled for income, non-whites face higher concentrations of liquor stores than do whites. Wow. Now that's a hundred percent true. When you go to the um, to the white neighborhoods, um, you see, yeah, they got liquor stores, but there's not like <laughs> ideas in the hood, man. Like you know, you'll see a liquor store to be one. It'll be one big nice one, and it like service the whole area. You know, it's like that's where you go. But when you're in the hood, liquor store after liquor store, man. Liquor store after liquor store, man. Straight up, you got, you know, especially like uh, you know in the big cities, man. You talking about dang liquor store on every corner, man. And then yeah, you got your liquor store here. You got your cigarettes here. Then, you know, you got your blunt paper wrappings and everything. So, you got folk going in there for they, um, for they, um, for they, for they wrapping papers so they can get high. You got folk going in there getting their cigarette. You got folk going in there getting their liquor. And I even remember in Chicago, I used to see, they used to sell, like, drug equipment what they call it like paraphernalia like they would have the little scales and a little thing you mash up the rocks and i used to see that junk for sale in the snow man i don't know if they still do that or i don't know if it was just that one store because it was one of the most hood stores in the city man probably but but yeah that's how they got down man so uh now when you gonna put that junk in now they ain't finna come open up no Publix next to that you know, they ain't finna put no nice old, uh, uh what's that show called, uh, man, uh, uh, store called, um, Whole Foods and all that. They ain't finna put no Whole Foods next to that. Yeah, put an Aldi next to it. And a Food Depot or something, maybe, but, you know, they ain't put no dang, uh, Whole Foods and none of that next to it. So now you gotta pay top dollar price at Food Depot for meat that's just about to go bad, man. For products that have been sitting on the shelf for who knows how long in a store that's dirty than a mug. Mm. Oh man, here go another one. Student loans. In December 2007, a class action lawsuit was brought against the student loan lending giant Sally May in the United States District Court of Connecticut. The class alleged, the class alleged that uh, Sally May. Uh, discriminated against African Americans and Hispanic private student loan applications. The case, the case alleged that the um, alleged that the the factor Sally May used to underwrite private student loans caused a desperate impact on students attending schools with higher minority populations. The suit also alleged that Sally May failed to properly disclose loan terms to private student loan borrowers. It was settled in 2001. 
The terms of the settlement including them agreeing to make a $500,000 donation to the United Negro College Fund and the attorneys for the plaintiff receiving $1.8 million in attorney's fees. That don't sound like enough punishment to me, man. Credit card redlining is a spatially discriminatory practice among credit card issuers, providing different amounts of credit to different areas based on the ethnic minority composition rather than on economic criteria, such as the potential profiting, profitability of operating in those areas. Scholars assess certain policies, such as credit card issuers reducing credit lines of individuals with a record of purchases at retailers frequented by so-called high-risk customers to be a kid. What? So, if you... I guess so. Wells Fargo, or Bank of America, Chase, and all that—they looking at who you, <coughs> where you shop at, and if you shop, um, if you shop at a place where they think high risk customers are, then they won't give you a credit card, or they give you a reduced line of credit. Oh, we. Hey man. Oh, banks. Mm. Here we go. Much of the economic impacts we find as a result of redlining in the banking system directly impacts that of the American African American black community. Beginning in the sixty there was a large influx of black veteran veterans and their families moving to suburban white communities. As blacks moved in, whites moved out, and the market value of the homes dropped dramatically. In observation of said market values, black lenders were able to keep close track by literally drawing red lines around the neighborhoods of a map. These lines signified areas that they would not invest in by way of racial redlining. Not only banks, but savings and loans insurance companies, grocery chains, pizza delivery companies, uh, thought economic vitality in black communities. The severe lacking in civil rights laws in combination with the economic impact led to the passing of the Community Reinvestment Act in 77. Racial and economic redlining sets the people who live in these communities up for failure from the start, so much that banks would often deny people who came from these areas bank loans or offered them at stricter repayment rates. As a result, there was a very low rate at which people, in particular black people, were able to own their own homes, opening the door for slum landlords who could get approved for low interest loans in those communities, take over and do as they saw fit. So, the black man who grew up in that area, family been there for generations, he can't get no loan. When Big Mama died or Granddaddy died and the house going up for sale, he can't even get the house himself. So in come the white man, in come the, uh, wow, in come the, um, the, uh, the man from overseas, you know, they come in and they buy the building, and when they buy the building, they do what they want with it, and can't nobody tell them nothing, can't nobody stop them, what you gonna do? But, this where you grew up at, so you end up paying them and renting out to them but of course rent double what the mortgage would be so you know like mortgage on the house like you can pay six hundred dollars for a five bedroom and which uh if you own that mud but if you rent that mud you might be paying fifteen hundred and those real numbers <laughs> you just throw the mugs out you paying twelve to fifteen hundred in the hood man rent man they they killing us man Bro, they killing us, man. Like, I remember me and all, uh, we was looking for where we was going to move to. And uh, the only apartments that was like 600 or something, you talking about one, two bedrooms. Uh, that, that's the one bedroom. You talking about the one bedroom on Washington Road. And in Atlanta, Washington Road, one of the roughest spots in the city, man. You know, so... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. This is how it go. Insurance. 
Gregory D. Squires wrote in 03 that data showed that race continues to affect the policies and practices of the insurance industry. Racial profiling or redlining has a long history in the property insurance industry in the United States. From a view of industry underwriting and marketing materials, court documents, I ain't even look. I ain't even got to read this one. I can tell you right now. Um, I got, I got three. I got three old. Car, what I got? And me and my brother and my wife on my insurance together, and um, we all in our twenties, upper twenties, and uh, we got <laughs> we got two old cars and one semi old car, and we pay three. It was three ninety. They took it down to three seventy five when Corona hit. We ain't got no points or nothing, but they killing every month, man. Three ninety, every month, three ninety. Then when the policy over with, or when somebody turned twenty five, or you like, yeah, it's finna go down. Three ninety, three eighty, three seventy. That's a, you know that's cheap as it get. I remember back in the day, man. I had a ninety four Buick Roadmaster, man. And I was paying a hundred on that. And then I remember I had like a ninety-nine and uh what was it? A ninety-nine uh like the big the big Honda. I can't remember what it's called, Honda or whatever. I can't remember what it's called right now. But the big one and uh and they talking about that's a luxury car, <laughs> so I paid like a hundred and twenty, hundred and fifty or something. I'm like, man, y'all tripping, man. What you mean a luxury car? So if, what if I had a Benz then? That was that a, a double X luxury car, like you know, stupid stuff. So they're killing us on insurance, man, because of where we live, and because we black, they're killing us, man. Young and black, and where we live, they they getting over on us real good. Don't make no sense. I didn't pay an insurance. I didn't. Okay, like think about this. I bought. Let's say I, I bought my car. My brother called. He bought it for two grand. So if he paying a uh, hundred, let's just say, let's say we got one three ninety. So he paying like one thirty a month on his car. So if you paying one thirty a month, you do that job for twelve. You do that for a year. Let me see. You do it for ten months. That's thirteen hundred. Then the next two months, thirteen. You are, you know what I'm saying? You done paid. So like he done had the car for. Man, how many years now? So we ain't had the car for like six years. So he been paying a hundred thirty dollars a month for six years. He didn't pay for that car over and over and over and over again. Basically, almost once a year, he's paying for the car all over again. And the ninety nine bought that for twenty five hundred, had it for six seven years. That's you done paid for the car over and over and over again, man. I bought the Buick back in the day for seven hundred, and the insurance was a hundred dollars. So that means twice a year, I'm paying for my car, <laughs> you know. And never had no accident, never had nobody hit me, never hit nobody, you know. So anyway, yeah, that's all I need to read from insurance, man. Now, with mortgages, reverse redlining occurs when a lender or insurer particularly targets minority consumers not to deny them loans, but to charge them more than would be charged to uh, somebody in the same situation that was white. Now, specifically marketed the most um, expensive and uh, one, one risk, I ain't never seen that word, one risk loan products. These communities had largely been ignored by most lenders just a couple of decades earlier. Now, in the 2000s, some financial institutes considered black communities as suitable for subprime mortgages. Wells Fargo partnered with churches in black communities where the pastor would deliver wealth-building seminars and their sermons, and the bank would make a donation in return for every new mortgage application. Working Ooh, we. See, they know. Ooh, that's ooh, that's dirty. See, they know when you in the hood, you ain't got nothing but faith. When you done been broke generation after generation after generation, you ain't got nothing but faith. 
how you know you like dang <laughs> we everybody been broke like god i need you to i need your help because i ain't never seen no money I ain't never seen no college degrees. I ain't never seen no success. Doctors, lawyers, and all that stuff, man. All I know is my uncle who work on cars. You know, my mama got a little part-time gig at the up at the school, serving lunch. Well, you know, we ain't never seen no real success. So the way we feel like the only way we gonna ever get the chance is by God, man. Which is true. It's true. But Wells Fargo took advantage of that. You got a lot of churches in the hood, man. And you also have a lot of false churches in the hood. A lot of people talk and talk just to make money. That's true, too. Took advantage of it. Teamed up with Wells Fargo and uh, preached in a way that would make people go and have some faith in signing up for these loans. And then threw the church a couple of dollars. Because that couple of dollars they threw the church ain't nothing compared to all that money they're going to make on the back end with that interest. Wow. Working class backs wanted a part of the nation's homeowning trend. Instead of contributing to home ownership and community progress, predatory lending practices through reverse redlining stripped the, equi- stripped the equity homeowners struggled to build and drained the wealth of those communities for the enrichment of financial firms. The growth of subprime lending, lending higher cost loans to borrowers with flaws in their credit, Prior to the 08 financial crisis, coupled with growing law enforcement activities in those areas, clearly showed a surge in the range of manipulation practices. Not all these loans were predatory, but virtually all predatory loans were subprime. Some subprime loans certainly benefit high-risk borrowers who would not qualify for conventional prime loans. Predatory loans, however, charge unreasonably higher rates and fees by compared to the risk trapping homeowners in unaffordable debt and often costing them their homes and life savings mm-hmm. see when you go back at the house it's looking all good cause everybody getting houses everybody getting houses but because of the crime and stuff they not putting no money back into the area they not opening up stores and they not putting jobs and stuff in so the area, the value of the area not going up. So since the area value is not going up, now you stuck. And this house you got ain't worth none because you owe more on the house than the house is worth. Because of that interest rate. And you didn't, oh, no, you ain't got to put no money down. Don't worry about it. So they won't take no money up front. Or you did to put your little life savings in up front, but it don't matter anyway because still the area ain't worth nothing. You can't sell the house and come up off of it. You just stuck paying this huge interest rate along with your rent. I know a man that was living on the west side of Chicago in K Town, one of the most hood on the on the block where. This block was literally like drug. It was the block was so bad that whenever I went over there, <laughs> you couldn't go past. You couldn't go past a certain house. It was this lady house, and that was it. That was the cutoff point. You could not go past the cutoff point. <laughs> Like that was the gun line, you know. You couldn't go past the gun line. You stay down there on that side of the block. It's still hood, but you kind of hide. But once you go across the gun line, you know, hey. So uh, he was paying fifteen hundred dollars a month. Now, bro, we talking about when I was in. Man, we talking about. Oh, dang, twenty years ago. Let me see. What grade was that? Fifth? No, nah, six. Six, seven, eighth. Talking about six, seven, eighth grade, man. Four, fifth, six, seven, like that time. So let me see how old am I? Ten, I guess at that time. Ten, twelve. So I'm ten, twelve years old. 
That's uh, almost 20 years ago. 18, 17 years ago. Paying $1,500 a month to stay in the worst hood. One of the worst streets in Chicago. was really over there. Every street the worst street in Chicago. Folks couldn't afford to pay that today. They couldn't pay that today. And that's what he's paying. Trying to hold on to the house that his mama done had for blah, blah, blah years. Dang, man. As I'm reading this, man, it's all... It's all coming into... Like all I'm seeing it now. Mm. Wow. Dang man, this is crazy, man. Redliner has helped preserve segregated living patterns for blacks and whites in the United States. As discrimination is often contingent on the racial composition of neighborhoods and the race of the applicant. Lending institutions such as Wells Fargo have been shown to treat black mortgage applicants differently when they are buying homes in white neighborhoods than when buying homes in black neighborhoods. So they're going to send you through the ringer before they let you go out with them white folk at, huh? Dan Emmer Gluck writes in O2 that in small businesses in black neighborhoods receive fewer loans even after accounting for businesses, business density. Business size, industrial mix, neighborhoods, income, and credit quality of local businesses. So uh, he even put the factors in and tried to, I guess, make it all square. And he still said they got fewer loans. Several state attorney generals have begun investigating these practices, which may be, which may violate fair. What do you mean, may violate? The NAACP filed a class action lawsuit charging systematic racial discrimination by more than a dozen banks. Wow. Dang, man. Okay, workers living in American inner cities have more difficulty finding jobs than suburban workers do. Yeah, I can see that, man. Probably look right at your zip code. Oh, I guess not. They just looking at your zip code. Shoot, I wonder if you change your zip code on your resume, you know, would you get the chance to get a job you probably wouldn't have got um, if your zip code was something else. Somebody who out there looking for a job, shoot, I'm kind of, I'm looking for me a, a J-O-B-B. <laughs> maybe I'll, uh, yeah, maybe I'll try that out. Dang, man. Policies related to redlining and urban decay can also act as a form of environmental racism, which in turn affect public health. Urban minority communities may face environmental racism in the form of parks that are smaller, less accessible, and a poorer quality than those in more affluent or white areas in some cities. Man, that's so true, man. Parks is way smaller, way lamer. You talking about just like random stupid things for the kids to play on not even full playground sets just a little piece of that a little piece of this they don't fix the wood chips up they don't clean it up they don't clean the bathrooms the bathrooms is in just out of order all the time man when I was doing deliveries and stuff and I'm in a still every when I'm doing a delivery and I go across the park and I gotta use the bathroom and I'm out in a in a suburb Shoot, I go there. The park, the dang bathroom in the park be better than it do in, um, in the dang other spots, man. The park bathroom nicer than, um, you know, nicer than the, the restaurants and stuff, man. Nicer than, um, gas stations and all that, man. But don't try that junk in the hoods. <laughs> Ooh -wee. Don't try that, man. Now, this has a, an effect on health because young people have fewer places to play and adults have fewer opportunities for exercise. Yeah, that's true. But uh, what it really affects is you don't have a safe place to play. You don't have a place where you can go and it's just kids that, you know, kids playing on the same block where they're selling rocks. So now when them boys get into it and get the shoe, 
somebody get shot that you know shouldn't have got shot because they are on the same block trying to you know or you trying to play ball in the street and you know it's oh it's a, it don't make no sense now this is something we do to ourselves you know kids and stuff in the streets and we come flying down the block flying down the block man and you know kids be in the street because you live here and even if you don't live there common sense say if you're not on the highway and you're on the street where his house is at it's a chance that there's some kids out here so you can't even sit in peace and let your kid play because see what i'm saying Man, I drive through neighborhoods. I see kids playing. When I was doing deliveries, man, they just having a good time. Parents not even outside. All the kids just playing and playing. I ain't got nothing to worry about. But it ain't like that. It ain't like that in the hood, though. Robert Wallace writes that the patterns of the AIDS outbreak during the 80s was affected by the outcomes of a program of planned shrinkage directed at African Americans and Hispanic communities. It was implemented through systematic denial of municipal services, uh, particularly fire protection resources essential to, to maintain urban levels of population density and ensure community stability. Institutionalized racism affects general health care as well as the quality of AIDS health intervention and services in minority communities. The overrepresentation of minorities in various disease categories, including AIDS, is particularly partially related to environmental racism. The national response to the AIDS epidemic in minority communities was slow during the 80s and 90s showing an intensity to ethnic diversity and prevention efforts and AIDS health services. Same thing like uh, happened with COVID. You know, we all with COVID hit, COVID hit the uh, hood the worst. And uh, it's just less things, less people got health insurance, less people, because people got worse jobs. People ain't got no job. People paying higher insurance. People paying higher mortgage. People paying higher rent. People paying higher on a car loan. You paying higher on everything because of where you born at. So you ain't got you ain't got no health insurance, and your job don't even offer it. You ain't got it. So since you ain't got these basic needs, people suffering from COVID. People suffering from high blood pressure. You know, people suffering from diabetes. They suffering from all these things, and they ended up getting sick. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, you know, and then as I'm, you know, looking through this, I'm not saying nothing about, um, you know, uh, what's it called? Uh, nothing about the schools, man. I ain't saying nothing about school. Digital redlining is a term used to refer to the practice of creating and perpetuating inequities between racial, cultural, and class groups, specifically through the use of digital technologies, digital content, and the internet. Digital redlining is an extension of the historical housing discrimination practices of redlining to include an ability to discriminate against vulnerable classes of society using algorithms, connected digital technologies, and big data. The extension of this term tends to include both geographically based and non-geographically based discrimination. Wow. The HUD charged Facebook with housing discrimination over the company's targeted advertising prices, uh, practices. While these charges included geographically based targeting in the form of a tool that allowed uh, advertisers to draw a red line on a map, they also included non-geographically based methods that did not use maps but rather utilized algorithms tar targeting using Facebook's user profile information to directly exclude specific, specific groups of people. Oh, man, so... There's even political redlining, and it's a process of 
restricting the supply of political information with assumptions about demographics and present or past opinions. It occurs when political campaign managers uh, delimit which population is less likely to vote and design information campaigns only with likely voters in mind. It can occur when politicians, lobbyists, or political campaign managers identify which communities to actively discourage from voting through voter suppression campaigns. Um, so they're using the internet. They're using Facebook. They're using our social media. And then they purposely targeting people who vote. And purposely leaving people who they assume won't vote out of the running. Um, this is, uh, you know, this is eye opening to me. I didn't know that. Uh, I guess you know it makes sense. But when I thought of redlining, I always thought of it like with the home ownership, and I just thought it was, you know, to keep the folks from getting houses bad or the. Or to get them bad loans and then snatch it back from them. But it's a lot deeper than that. That simple thing of doing folks wrong on the houses is destroying the whole hood. Man, this is... Uh... So, you know, uh, this is why Chicago and Detroit and all these major cities that you see so much crime in, Atlanta and different parts of New York and parts of California this is the reason parts of you know, Houston and, you know, uh, New Orleans this is the reason why these cities have just these huge you know crime crime zones man because they've been destroyed for generations man they've been you know preyed on for generations man so I do this video to show you that um, there are some things that's been stacked up against us, and it ain't just black, you know, but it's, uh, it's white people and Hispanic people suffer from this thing too. So I do this to show that, um, yeah, it's stacked up against us, but when you learn what's stacked up against you, you can fight it.